Welcome to our Catechism class. It's a weekly look at the Heidelberg Catechism to help you learn Christian doctrine with a warm and practical application. Each lesson has its own study guide, and the web link to find that guide can be found in the episode notes. Okay, let's start the lesson. So welcome to our Catechism class. Today we're talking about forgiveness in the Heidelberg Catechism. In order to prepare for our Catechism class, please read Psalm 51, verse 1 to verse 7. So in our lesson today, we're going to examine the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. The Catechist asks us, What is the fifth petition? The answer we must give is forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. That is, for the sake of Christ's blood, do not impute to us wretched sinners any of our transgressions, nor the evil which still clings to us, as we also find this evidence of your grace in us, that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbour. So let's think about forgiveness. Let's think about God's forgiveness of us as sinners. Let's think about our response to that forgiveness and willingly offering forgiveness to others. I'm Bob McAvoy, and this is the Semper Reformata Podcast. In Lord's Day 51, the Catechist teaches us three very important principles in his answer. Three principles that are implied when we pray this petition. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The first of those is that we are all wretched sinners. The second point that the Catechist teaches is that every day we must ask God for forgiveness. And finally, that we should always be examining our lives to make sure that we are truly forgiven and that the knowledge of this forgiveness is affecting how we live our Christian life. So let's look at those three teaching points. Well, the first of those is that we are all wretched sinners. The Catechist says, For the sake of Christ's blood, do not impute to us wretched sinners any of our transgressions. He's echoing the words of the psalmist in Psalm 143 and verse 2. Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. So consider for a moment or two the awfulness of our sinful condition. When we come before God to pray the Lord's Prayer, we come as wretched sinners. It's not just enough to tell us that we are sinners by nature and practice, but the catechist here compounds that by referring to the utter wretchedness of our sinful condition. In Reformed theology, we sometimes speak of the total depravity of man. It's a theme that runs throughout the whole Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let's think about it for a moment. First of all, it's a condition that is common to all mankind. Read Psalm 51 and verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. In Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20. For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. So it's a condition that is common to all of mankind. And it's a condition that affects and ruins every aspect of our lives. When we speak of the total depravity of mankind, we're not saying that everyone is as utterly depraved as possible. 
that a liar or a homework cheat is as bad as a rapist or a murderer, or that a small child is as wicked as Hitler, we're saying that our depravity is such that it affects every part of our life and personality. Our hearts are wicked, and that inner sickness, that sinfulness, works itself out in our will and in our mind and in our deeds and in our words. Paul explains this to Pastor Titus, the minister of the Christian church in Crete. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 15, To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. Now it's very important to understand this. One of the mantras of the modern age is just be yourself, be happy, follow your heart, be true to yourself. Let me give you a good example of that. Have you ever had any connection with the Guard Guides organisation? When you look at them, they seem on the surface to be a benign enough organisation. An organisation that teaches young girls to be good citizens. An organisation that frequently meets in churches, even some professedly evangelical churches. But when you scratch the surface, all is not as it seems. The Guides once invited all its members and leaders to make a promise to serve God. Later, that was changed to make a promise to serve my God. A major step towards syncretism. And it's changed yet again. It now reads, I promise that I will do my best to be true to myself and develop my beliefs. That's a godless oath, if ever there was one. Its purpose is that in their words, in the words of the girl guides themselves, for girls to be comfortable with who they are. We help them to be brave enough, they say, to stand up for the things that are important to them, whilst celebrating the special things that make them happy. We talk to them, say the guides, about how sometimes being true to themselves means making difficult decisions, even if their friends don't agree. Now, how utterly depraved is that oath? What if doing what makes me happy is something that involves sexual immorality? Because to follow our heart, to do our desires, to do what makes me happy, is in fact inherently sinful. Because our hearts are sinful, and our hearts will lead us astray if we follow the desires of our heart alone. Let's see what the Bible says about this. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What would you want to follow your heart for, if your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked? Jesus said in Mark chapter 7 and verse 20, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. It would be better if organizations like the girl guides who are exercising some form of influence over children and sometimes in churches if they were to say to their young people don't follow your heart don't attempt to be true to yourself your wicked sinful heart will lead you further and further away from god and you will not find happiness you will find guilt and shame and eternal condemnation don't be deceived by innocuous-sounding organizations like the Girl Guides. Check everything out thoroughly before you allow your children to be part of a politically correct, woke organization. So our wretchedness is a condition that is common to all of mankind. And our wretchedness is a condition that affects and ruins every aspect of our lives. And our wretchedness as is implied in the word, is a miserable condition. It's wretchedness. Do you know, in Northern Ireland here where I live, if you ask someone how they're keeping today and they say, do you know, I really feel wretched, you'll know that they're very poorly. You'll know that they're very sick. Now, we are poor, guilty, wretched sinners. 
and because we are living lives that are well astray from our created purpose of bringing glory to our Creator, we will be deeply unfulfilled and deeply unhappy. Do you know the first step to forgiveness is actually to admit that you need forgiveness, is to admit that you're a wretched sinner, to acknowledge the fact before God, to fully appreciate the depth of sin and the eternal consequences of willfully remaining in a state of unforgiveness. We are wretched sinners. Now the second point that the Catechist makes is that we must then ask for our sins to be forgiven. We're to pray, forgive us our debts. You see, it's not just enough to believe that I'm a worthless sinner without any further action on my part. We must ask for that sin to be forgiven. In fact, living with an awareness of sin, living with our conscience deeply troubled and unable to find respite would lead to a life of utter despair. It's bound to lead to depression, perhaps I would think even to suicidal thoughts. That's why so many of those who are living in what's so-called alternative lifestyles, living in a conscious state of open rebellion against God and his ordered plan for humanity, those people often have a really high suicide rate among their number. In fact, the further that our lives diverge from God's standards, from his created intent for us, the more miserable we we become. Someone once asked, what would you say to a young gay man who was contemplating suicide because they heard that homosexuality was a sin? My answer to that is very simple. Repent. Repent of your sin. Have it forgiven. Have peace in your heart. In fact, just knowing that we're hopeless sinners brings us misery and sorrow. Paul deals with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 to 10, where a letter that he has written earlier to Corinth has made them very aware of their sin. He says, therefore, godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. The burden that sin imposes upon the sinner, the weight of guilt and shame, will bring us to the very lowest level of human despair. It's why the preacher, who would be true to the gospel, must not only preach the law, let the law thunder out from the pulpit, but preach God's grace, his love for sinners, his willingness to forgive that brought Christ to the cross. So being convinced that we are guilty, wretched sinners, we must ask God to forgive us all of our sins. Now that begs the question, what will praying for forgiveness involve? Our instructor helps us with the content of that sinner's prayer. It involves pleading the blood of Christ for the sake of Christ's blood says the Catechist. Now, what does he mean by that? What does he mean by this phrase, for the sake of Christ's blood? Now, we must never think of the blood of Christ as a kind of a superstitious talisman, a good luck charm to ward off evil. Let me explain. A group of Christian singers were setting off to take part in a meeting in the town of Cookstown. So before they left, they thought it prudent to pray to pray that the Lord would protect them on their journey so that they would arrive safely. One of the men led the group in prayer. He prayed, Lord, give us journeying mercies and cover this car in your blood. Now I'm quite sure that in his providence, God does protect us as we travel. 
But that's not what we mean when we talk about pleading the blood of Jesus. When we're talking here and when the catechist is teaching us about the praying for the sake of Christ's blood, praying for forgiveness for the sake of Christ's blood, that's about our sins being blotted out. When Jesus died for us, when he shed his blood for us as the sacrificial lamb. Matthew Henry expresses this prayer like this. For his sake we entreat you, blot out all our transgressions, and enter not into judgment with us. Through him let us be reconciled to God, and let the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands be cancelled and set aside, being nailed to the cross of Christ, that we may be made alive together with Christ, having all our trespasses forgiven us. In First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, we read, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So it involves pleading the blood of Christ, this sinner's prayer. And it involves laying down our burden of sin at the cross. Sometimes we talk about simply resting in Christ's finished work. So the Catechist says, Do not impute to us wretched sinners any of our transgressions. In Romans 8 and 1, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. All of those wicked sins which emanate from the heart are forgiven, having been laid upon God's spotless Son, and instead were credited with his perfect righteousness. Second Corinthians 5 and 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this sinner's prayer involves pleading the blood of Christ. It involves resting in Christ's finished work on the cross. It involves continual lifelong repentance. For the catechist acknowledges here that there is evil which still clings to us and that it is forgiven too, that it was covered by Christ's blood of the cross. In our last catechism class, we looked at the fourth petition in the Lord's Prayer, the petition that reads, Give us this day our daily bread. And we find out that this is a continual duty, for because we are to pray only for enough bread for this day, we will then need to pray tomorrow for enough bread for that day. So praying for daily sustenance from God becomes a daily task. When we pray... We say, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. We should certainly pray for today's bread today. After all, bread is perishable, it grows steel. But God's forgiveness doesn't grow perishable. So why would we need to ask God for forgiveness every day? Aren't we fully forgiven when we are saved? Aren't we saved and capped by the sovereign grace of God? Don't we believe in eternal security? Well, yes to all of that. Yet we are simultaneously saints and sinners. And we will not attain perfection in this life. So Matthew Henry teaches us to pray in his book, A Way to Pray, a prayer for the daily forgiveness of sins. Lord, as duly as we pray every day for our daily bread, we pray for the forgiveness of our sins. For we are all held accountable to God. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all stumble in many ways every day. Who can tell how often he stumbles? If you should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. God, be merciful to us sinners. 
so our sinner's prayer is laid out for us by the catechist. It consists of humbly petitioning God to forgive us, not because we are good people who need some life improvement, but because we are sinners for whom Christ has died and shed his precious blood at the cross. And we lay that great burden of sin down at the foot of the cross. We rest on Christ's finished work, and every day we come before the Lord confessing our sins as part of our repentant lifestyle. Finally, the Catechist insists that we should look for the evidence of God's grace and his forgiveness dwelling within us. He says, We also find this evidence of your grace in us, that we are fully determined wholeheartedly to forgive our neighbour. In Matthew chapter 18, In verse 34 to 35, there's a serious warning for those who are forgiven and who refuse to forgive. His master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So we're to examine ourselves. We're to look inwardly. The Lord's Prayer includes with the phrase, Forgive us our trespasses, the phrase, As we forgive those who trespass against us. We've been forgiven a huge debt, freely forgiven. What a great sense of relief it brings to the redeemed soul to know that the burden of sin and condemnation has been lifted off us But now let us examine ourselves. Let's make sure that God's free gift of forgiveness has actually taken effect in our lives. And what will be the litmus test that we will use for that self-examination? It will be our willingness to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Look at how the Catechist words it. We are fully determined wholeheartedly. My goodness, that's fairly dogmatic language, isn't it? It's not a half-hearted offer of forgiveness. It's not semi-forgiveness. It's not that kind of forgiveness that says, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. It's not the kind of forgiveness that leaves the door open for simmering resentment that never goes away. We're to offer complete forgiveness to others, fully determined wholeheartedly, to offer complete forgiveness to others, just like the forgiveness that we have received from our Heavenly Father in Christ. A wee word of caution. Way back in the 1970s and 80s, when Northern Ireland was deeply embroiled in the vicious IRA campaign against the state, you would have heard people talking, people who'd been deeply hurt and lost loved ones, and perhaps been injured and maimed by terrorist actions. And they'd be talking about how they had forgiven murderers and terrorists who had done this terrible damage. Now, we would have great sympathy for those deeply affected victims of terror. But be careful. While we're to be prepared to forgive others, and while we should offer that forgiveness Claiming to forgive unrepentant terrorists is futile, for they will fling your offer of forgiveness back in your face. Forgiveness and repentance go hand in hand. Pay careful attention to the words of Jesus in Luke 17 and verse 3, where he says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, 
forgive him. Now, do you see the difference? We're to have a wholehearted willingness to forgive, but forgiveness involves repentance. So be careful. So we have considered the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Let's summarize it. We're sinners who need forgiveness. If we don't have that forgiveness, our sin will overwhelm us and eventually it will drive us to hopeless despair. So if we're convinced of our sin and we're humbly repentant of it, we pray for God to forgive us, knowing that when we receive such forgiveness, we will be grateful and that gratitude will cause us to forgive others as the Lord has forgiven us. Mm-hmm.